Hi, David Bizard here, and you guys are watching PowerTech 10. Give me a few minutes of your time, and I will give you the benefit of over 60 years of building race winning engines. In this episode, going by up there, we are going to delve into part four of rule number one. And basically, this involves valve seats, valve shapes, and port design. We're going to start with the valve seat, just a basic valve seat, and then we're going to plow on from there. As good a place to start as any is at the basic performance valve seat. So follow along with this upcoming diagram. What we have here is a 30 degree top cut, a 45 degree seat, then a 60 degree cut or a radius, the radius being preferable. Below that, that's the green section, we have a 75 to 80 degree cut. Now that will serve as a good starting place for the valve seat design. So how important is the valve seat? Number one important factor in sonder head design, especially at low lift and especially in an undervalved engine, which almost all V8s are. So let's focus on this next diagram and I'll go through how the efficiency of the valve seat changes with design. At position number one, we have a sharp edge and the diameter of the valve throat is the diameter of the valve. In other words, we've got the largest hole possible that a valve could theoretically seal up in. You'll notice the efficiency is not very good, 45%. Now we move on to number two. That's just a plain ordinary valve seat, typically of about 60 thousandths wide on what we would typically find for a V8 engine. Right, efficiency goes up to about 57%, still not very good. Number three, we do a lead in, a 60 degree cut below the 45, and the efficiency jumps to 65%. At number four, we do a top cut, a 30 degree top cut and the efficiency jumps up to 70%. Then we do one of these really fancy ones as in five, and that is a lead out of the seat, a 30 degree top cut, 45 degree seat, 60 degree bottom cut, and it's blended in. That gives us about 72 to 73%, and that's about it. Now we can improve on that with super trick seats, but out of the box for just putting a seat on, that's what you can expect. Now, before we go much further, I should define some terms that I commonly use. One of the most important of these is what I mean by the 0.25D lift or the quarter D lift. So let's take a look at the diagram here. So, looking at the diagram, we see that the valve diameter is represented by the letter D. And it should be easy to see that the quarter D lift is a lift that corresponds to a quarter of the valve diameter. That means if we've got a two inch valve, the quarter D lift would be 500 thousandths. Now, you may well ask, well, so what? Certain things happen at a quarter D lift in terms of flow. If we do not know about them, 
they can we could be sacrificing a whole load of top end flow figures. This phenomena is what makes pro stock motors so effective in terms of making a horsepower from what looks to be limited valve area. So let's move on and keep that quarter D factor in mind. Oh, well, there was one thing I wanted to mention here about that quarter D lift. At a quarter D lift, the curtain area around the valve equals the area of the valve. Now it does say on the diagram, but the thing we need to note here is that at a quarter D lift, the area that the valve could present to the cylinder cannot get any more because the curtain area will now exceed the valve area, right? And technically, or to be more accurate, we reach that limit of area sooner because if we took the throat diameter, we would find that it would reach the quarter D point after the area had ceased to increase from valve opening. Let's talk about seats a, a little more here. So what I want to do now in this next section is talk about valve seat angles. So let's have at it. Take a look at the diagram in the right. Here you will see two valve seats. One, the top one, a 45 degree seat, and the lower one, a 30 degree seat. Now it's not commonly realized that if you lift a valve, say 50 thousandths, as shown here, the gap between the seat of the valve and the cylinder head does not end up at 50 thousandths. A 45 degree seat lifted 50 thousandths gives a 35 thousandths gap between the seats, whereas a 30 degree seat gives a 40 three thousandths gap. Now you may well think, why don't we use a 30 degree seat? Because it will present area, breathing area, to the cylinder faster. Well, we'll get to that in a moment, but for now let's take a look at the uh, diagram on the left. What we see here in the area indicated is the improvement a 30 degree seat gives in the amount of area that it presents to the cylinder. This gain in area decays as the lift gets higher and higher. And by the time you get to about 250 thousandths lift, there's not a lot of difference between the two, but it initially gives a huge increase in low lift flow. And that happens in practice. Now, the theoretical line based on the OD of the valve is shown in red. That's simplistic form. What I'm showing here with the 30 degree over 45 degree area is what happens in real life because the areas presented go through three different phases. That's why it's a funny shape like that. And it doesn't become a fixed formula until the lift on a typical V8 engine is past about 250 300 thousands. Here's an example of a well-developed 30 degree seat. As for flow efficiency, a seat like this will, at low lift, deliver over 80% flow efficiency. So it's well worth considering, but it comes with its own set of drawbacks. So what are these drawbacks that we have to uh, uh, address uh, and they're relevant to valve seat angles? Well, this all cropped up while I was doing research for anti-reversion valves for my A-series mini engine. That's the original Mini Cooper. Uh, I was racing one at at the time and I certainly couldn't afford any of these fancy Cosworth engines to put into it which were costing more than my house cost but that meant I had to research the iron based race engine using the original type head modified extensively and one of the things that became apparent 
was that valves tended to leak at high RPM without necessarily showing any signs of such. And here's how it happened. The A-series engine can suffer quite a bit of uh, reversion um, due to the Siamese ports on it. You know, one port feeds two cylinders. And um, so what I did was I designed a valve which on the flow bench had a very bad reverse flow. And it involved cutting a groove in the valve face as per this shot that I'm showing over here. It causes a, it gives a ridge on the side of the land that any flow trying to go round the valve and out has a very poor shape, a very unstreamlined shape, which inhibits the flow, cuts reverse flow by quite a bit. But another thing it also does is it makes the seat flexible hadn't uh, occurred to me at that moment in time. Anyway, when I dyno tested these valves, they really worked at low RPM. They added something like a thousand RPM of usable RPM down at the bottom end of what was normally the power curve. So, you know, this motor came on the cam at about 3,500 before. Now it came on the cam at 2,500. So at 2,500 RPM, up to 35 or 4,000 RPM, the torque was up considerably. Mid-range, it didn't change. Now, much to my surprise, when I got to peak power, the engine didn't drop off in the normal way. It kept on going. And I achieved, well, no, the engine achieved about five horsepower more and about a 500 RPM increase in usable RPM range. This puzzled me. Why? Because there was no indication of any reversion at those RPMs, but it must have been curing something. So I had to look into it. And that's what I did over an extended period of time. I investigated what the situation was with valve seats and seat flexibility. As time went by, more and more evidence for this leakage theory turned up. It didn't prove it, but it did indicate in a stronger fashion each time a little bit of suggested leakage was cured. But anyway, before I get to that, let me backtrack and show you what a 30 degree seat will do and how the fix that I had for anti-reversion also applied to leakage. First, a look at our 30 degree seat flow gains. Well, it doesn't take much to see that the gain at low lift was as much as 21%. 15% off the seat and at 50 thousandths, 21% up, that is a big gain. What it does is it makes a two inch valve look like it's actually 2.4 inches. Try stuffing a 2.4 inch valve into a typical small block Chevy. But the gains only hold good to about 300 thousandths and I'm talking about typical V8 now. After that, it's not a lot to do with the seat, it's almost all to do with the port. So the flow looks good. But now let's get back to our leakage situation and how it pertains to various valve seat angles. To understand why we may get valve leakage, even from an apparently perfect valve seat job, we need to investigate what happens to the cylinder head as it expands from the heat generated by combustion. Well, here's the diagram. This was developed from work I did during my tenure at uh, UNC Charlotte. Now, what we did was we measured the temperatures on a running engine. I think I did that in my shop. And then I used a computer program that the university had to generate the form that develops 
as temperature variations across the width of the chamber distort it. Now I want you to study this diagram carefully. Note that between the exhaust valve and the intake valve there's high expansion. Low expansion on the other side of the intake valve. Also the center line of the uh, valve guide changes. Right, so it actually wants to move the valve over uh, slightly at an angle. Also, the uh, uh, seat, the, and I'm just talking about the intake seat here, also the seat is ovalized, it becomes more egg-shaped than anything, and of course this is greatly exaggerated on this drawing. I think the ratio was 100 to 1 or something, or even 500 to 1 on the, on the drawing. Also, the seat gets higher on the intake valve adjacent to the exhaust, whereas the exhaust seat gets lower there because it's cooler. Right, so there's a lot of distortion goes on there. Now, we need to cut our seats not to be super accurate when they're sitting on the valve seat machine, but super accurate when they're actually being run under full power. Well, we might be asking too much of them. Well, if our valve seat form isn't enough to contend with, consider this. This just worsens the situation. If you take a look at a valve uh, or a valve train being run on a spintron with high-speed photography, you will see that the valve, both the retainer end and the head end, wobble around like they're made of rubber. Now, I kid you not, I have seen as much as a 16th inch deflection at the valve tip end. On the other hand, there's usually less at the valve head. Usually, not always. I mean, I don't have enough experience to say how common one is compared with the other. But it is easy to have the valve head 10 or 15 thousandths off center the moment before it hits the valve seat, what happens is it has to, when it hits that valve seat, it has to slide down it, right? Now then, if that valve seat is not a steep enough angle, the friction level will not be overcome by the wedging action of the valve. Hence the use of 50 and 55 degree seats. They work partly because they give more high lift flow than a 45 degree seat and partly because they seal better. I don't think many people have taken this sealing uh, aspect into account. But anyway, the trick is, can we get a flatter angle to seal as well? Well, the answer is yes. It takes a bit of work, but we can do it. So hence that 30 degree seat, which has very poor self-centering action compared with a 55 degree seat, can be made to work. So earlier on, I showed you a diagram face on the valve with a confirmation groove around it. Well, we find that almost any valve benefits from having this groove because not only does it sort out and reduce reversion, but also it will make the valve seat more flexible so that it can conform to an out of round seat. A 30 degree seat, the use of a 30 degree seat virtually demands this groove. Diagram over there. And it's not a bad idea to, to apply it to either a regular 45 degree seat and it will help power and I've done it once on a 50 degree seat and it looked like it was slightly better so it has almost universal application but to be honest for a really effective seal we need to go slightly further and I'll look at that in a while.
For now, let's move on to valve forms, as that can be a very significant factor in our airflow. I think it's pretty common knowledge that the simplest thing you can do to any valve, especially a 45 degree seat valve, is to cut a small 30 degree back cut on it. This helps streamline the back of the valve into the seat. When I'm doing cylinder heads for myself or clientele, I get most of the valves I use either from Ferrea or Manly. Between the two of them, they have almost always got an off-the-shelf valve that works, and if I don't have the good fortune to have the shape I want off the shelf, Freya will make them up for me. Now, what we find is, is if we look through high-performance valves, we find that they tend to go from the valve shown here on the right to the valve shown on the left. That's the span of their range. You may see a small difference in the back of the valve. And another factor is you will find that exhaust valves have a larger diameter from the back of the valve into the stem. That's so that they can conduct heat away faster. Now let's look at some valve shapes that cover the extent and some that you may not have seen before. The valve to the left is what is most commonly used in a high performance engine which has a shallow downdraft angle. Typical Chevrolet Ford Chrysler engines of the 60s, 70s, 80s and into the early 90s. Maybe LS engines as well. The center valve is what we will use mostly on engines with a steeper downdraft port than average, probably something like a, a late model Chrysler Hemi. The back angle on that is about 18 to 20 degrees, whereas the one on the far left is typically 12 degrees. Now let's move to the valve on the right. This was a purpose designed valve which I did for my British Touring Car Championship Avenger. We had a lift limited to 390 because that was the spec. The advantage of this valve is that I could blend the back of the valve into the seat at 30 degrees. So there was no back cut on it. The valve shape itself was an entire back cut. The other factor is the port on the Avenger was a relatively steep downdraft angle. That valve worked very well, especially at low lift. So what happened was it made the engine think that the valve was opening far faster than it really was. And believe you me, the cam I designed for it was opening it fast already. Although we're only looking at a valve of about 1.65 and a lift of 390, I had a valve spring preload on the seat of about 180 pounds and over the nose of 440. Why? Because I was turning that SOB to 11,400 RPM. Pretty high RPM for a road racer. In fact, I was turning more RPM on this than Cosworth were doing with their, their BDAs and BDDs and so on. One thing about that spherical shaped back on that valve is that outside of testing on my Avenger cylinder head, which I did considerable amount of airflow work, I did not or have not used it on anything since. So there really needs some more exploration done there. Charlie, call to duty. Okay, a change in subject here. I'm going to start talking about bowls and ports. And although this is part four of rule number one, which is find the greatest restrictions and eliminate those first, 
it's going to merge into rule number two, which is, as you see, over there. Essentially, this rule says, let the air go where it wants to go. And you'll see that start to blend in with what I'm going to tell you next. So here we go, down to basics. Here is an absolute basic port shape. Well, here's our basic port shape. It's essentially a round port from one end to the other. In reality, every port is based on this with certain variations. And that's what we're going to look at now. The first and second drawing in the column here is our basic port, looking at it from above and from the side. Now, there, it has been said many times that a round hole flows more than any other shape. However, whoever said that, or whoever tells you that, has not allowed for the fact that an engine's port has to have a curve in it and a valve at the end of it. And that rewrites the rule books right there. So what we are going to do is to see how we can manipulate the port shape over that basic port shape to make it work better. So let's drop down to the third drawing on that list. In the next diagram down, you'll see that the port floor has been raised and it's made the short side turn much bigger. Now, you can be forgiven for thinking that's got to help the flow, but no, just doing that will actually cause that port to flow less. Why? Because we reduced the cross-sectional area at a point where it actually needs more area. Making, raising that port floor has caused the speed to go up and so it still detaches itself from the floor of the port. So the big radius did nothing. However, this is where the domino effect comes in. What we do now is to widen the port, which is the next drawing down, which is what we've done there. We widen both sides of the port. Now, as an isolated port, that will flow well, but nearly all of the ports we're going to do, now I should say all of them, have got a cylinder to feed, and there's going to be a cylinder wall on one side of the valve. So what we do is we bring the enlargement of the port across to the cylinder wall side, because the air is going to go out of that at an angle. And you'll see how I mean in the upcoming drawings. What we're going to have is a diagram showing why the 0.25D point is important. So let's just move on to that. Now, just to refresh your memory here, here's the 0.25D diagram again. And this is how it affects flow you will see that the majority of the flow at a lift figure above 0.25D starts to window out towards the center of the cylinder. This causes the flow efficiency to go up. And just so that you know exactly what I mean by flow efficiency, that's a simplistic name for the discharge coefficient. And let's have a look and see just how we can make that flow go up by biasing the port. Actually, on the diagram, it's biased this way. How we can bias the port to take advantage of that windowing effect. And you'll see that the flow efficiency can climb to way higher than it was at when it was at the 0.25 D mark. So here's a diagram. What you're seeing here are the discharge coefficients of a dark Chevy head that I ported some time back. Now, I want you to notice that it has high flow efficiency figures compared to those flow figures I showed earlier on. 
and I'm talking now about the, the low lift. As the lift goes up, you can see the efficiency drops off until it reaches the bottom of a hook. That hook's indicated. Now at that point, you'll notice there's two vertical lines on the graph, a red one and a blue one. These represent the 0.25D lift of the valves. In other words, at that red line and blue line, the valves are a quarter of their diameter in lift. Now, at that point, you'll see that the efficiency swings up. That is because I've taken advantage of that windowing effect that happens at high lift. And that is all down to getting the, uh, the bias on the port right. In other words, we're trying to lean that port we're trying to lean that port, either this way or that way, depending on it, towards the center of the cylinder. When we get that right, things really work out well for us. When I'm flowing pro stock heads, these are the kind of efficiency figures that I see. And for what it's worth, I've seen a pro stock head up to 90 plus percent efficient in flow. Let me make a point here. That's higher than virtually every F1 head that I've ever flowed. Now, a comment here. You'll notice that the exhaust climbs at a steeper angle than the intake does. Well, that is because the exhaust favors bias far more than the intake. In fact, the bias on the exhausts of most cylinder heads is barely enough. Uh, there comes a time when the bias needs to be about, let me see, uh, let's put this in terms of as much as 25% of what the valve is, right? That's, that's a lot. Now, I'll give you an idea of just how effective that can be. My friend David Anton at APT specializes in modifying mini heads and they're five port and the exhausts are right angle things like this. The worst port you could ever have or the most basic you could ever have and he puts just a ton of bias into those ports. It's a pretty delicate job and I've tried doing it have not got there but he has achieved 88% discharge coefficient from one of the world's ex worst exhaust ports solely because of attention to bias. Although we haven't come to the end of the line on bowl work, at this point I feel it's necessary to turn our attention to the actual main body of the port. Again, I'm going to use the CFD drawing which shows the path of the air. I, I must admit I'm getting some really good mileage from this drawing. So here it is. At first sight, this generous short side radius looks like it's a good deal. But there's a little more to it than meets the eye here. If you look carefully, you'll see that the flow just starts separating from the port about an inch in from the manifold face. By the time the bulk of the air has got round to the seat, the bulk flow direction is over a quarter of an inch away from the seat. So the flow has basically broken away from that turn. Now just ha imagine how it is with a typical port with a short side turn, which is probably only one third of that radius. Well, is it any wonder that the valve does not flow very well on that side? Now let's look and see how we can make this such that we apply rule two and that is let the air go where it wants to go not where we think it should go so how can we modify this port to more abide by that rule well first off look at the arrow which shows where the bulk flow goes what we should do is try and apply a port 
which follows that line. So let's move on to the next frame here. Watch carefully as the port transforms from its original curve shape to a much straighter shot to the back of the seat. Now, there were some constraints I applied here in as much as the port had to start at the same place and end up in the same position at the valve as the original. On the face of it, it looks like all we've done here is make a straighter shot to the bulk of the port, but the final inch or so still has the same radius that the port originally had. Now, if that port, the parallel bit, is more effective, what's going to happen there is that the air could come scooting across and where it starts to curve sharply, it will separate quicker. And therefore, that straight port may not be the answer to the job. What we've got to do here is get it around the corner. That's what a porter does. A good porter is good at getting air to go round the corner. And I'm talking about going round convex turns, not concave. Of course, you can get it to go around the long side. It can't do anything else. The short side is always the problem. What can we do here? Well, I'm going to start a little story, right? I'm sure you've heard of speed bumps. Well, I'm going to introduce you to a speed bump that is nothing like the ones that you know about, right? So let's take a look at that. Now, I should mention before going into details on this speed bump that this will be a technique you will apply after you have widened the port at the region around the bend, as shown by that previous uh, diagram where we went down a list of the progressive modifications until we came to the very last one, which had all the bias on one side. Now, after the port's been widened to what you think is going to be the limit of any benefit, you'll still find that in 99% of the cases that the air is still going too fast on the floor on the typical V8 engine port. Only those that are very sophisticated will have little trouble at this point. But for 99% of the heads out there, they will still be too fast over that short side turn. So this is where our bump comes in. Now, what you're going to see next is a mid-war years biplane. And I've never been able to find out what the correct way of pronouncing the name is, whether it's a Waco or a Waco. Right, but a friend of mine had one of these and he spent a seven figure number on having it restored. Well, the re I went to see it the day after it came back to his home, which had its own airfield at the back, by the way. And the one thing I have to say is I can't believe that they were ever built this well. That plane, when I got in it, smelt of leather, both cockpits. There's a cockpit for two people up front and the pilot sits in the rear cockpit. That is so that the weight balance always is the same, right? When you put the two people in the front cockpit, their weight is over the center of the wings. So it doesn't affect the weight balance whether there's three people in there or one. Now, if you look carefully and I'll zoom in, you'll see some black painted bulges on the cowling. And you may well suspect, and rightly so, that those bumps are to cover the rocker covers, which may stick out further than the rest of the engine. And it's what we call a round motor or radial motor, right? The cylinders are all going out like this. And I think that's a seven cylinder uh, engine, about 300 and 50 horsepower on there. I can't remember exactly. 
But the, my point is this. You look at those and you think, well, that's an easy way to save putting on an entirely bigger cowl so the frontal area is cut. Now, if you thought that, that would be very good. But the bottom line is this. Those bumps help the air go round the corner. So they make the cowl look smaller than it really is, right? If you position those bumps just right on that cowl, whether they have to cover uh, a valve, part of the valve gear or not, they will actually help the air make that turn and have less tendency to break away as it makes that turn. The result is that the cowl looks smaller in diameter than it really is. And on the Waco, I believe it's worth about five miles an hour on top speed. And don't quote me on that. That's what I've heard. Anyway, how can we apply those speed bumps to the port? This next diagram will show just that. Well, this diagram shows where we are at the last point of our port reshape. What I'm going to do now is treat the short side turn as if it was part of the perimeter of an aircraft cowling. I'm going to take one of those black streamlining shapes that are on the very edge of the cowling and apply it to that short side turn. So what we get is this. To better appreciate the side and plan view of that speed bump, here's a drawing which should make things totally clear. Well, I'm going to wrap things up for now as I've run way over the intended time. In fact, I thought I was going to get this video done in a day, and this is actually the end of the third day on it. If you want to continue to find out about ports, then the next episode will go on to rule number two, proper. In that, I'm going to look at lots of things that affect how we should think of and treat the air in the ports. So let's get together on rule number two. Thank you for watching.